Bose is the presenting partner of Beyond the Grid. That's because Bose QuietComfort 35 II goes beyond what you would expect from a pair of headphones. Just flip the switch to experience the industry-leading active noise reduction feature and all distractions of the world around you fade away, allowing you to focus on what matters to you. Hi, this is Jacques Villeneuve and you're about to listen to Beyond the Grid. Hello all, welcome to Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. Ready for some strong opinions? Well, you've come to the right place because this week's guest has never been backward in coming forward. He was non-conformist as a driver in how he looked, how he spoke and how he drove. Those who saw it will never forget his electrifying overtake around the outside of Michael Schumacher at Estoril in 1996. Ditto his controversial clash with the German at Jerez the following year. And what about that peroxide blonde hair? Have you guessed who I'm talking about yet? It is, of course, 1997 world champion Jacques Villeneuve. He remains as colourful and outspoken today as he was as a driver, but he's not just a brash talker. He's a smart cookie with some fascinating takes. Check it out. Jack, welcome to Beyond the Grid. Um, first things first, what is your secret? You do not look one day older than when you won the World Championship 21 years ago. There's obviously a knack that I have not learned. <laughs> <laughs> that means I was looking too old back then, I guess. I had no idea. Uh, keeping in the industry, uh, still being excited and passionate about it. So that's a way of staying young, I guess. And you're not, are you the same weight as when you were racing? Uh, within a kilos, yeah, that's, that's never changed, except that it used to be more muscle and now it's been replaced a little bit, but yeah, no, the, the weight hasn't changed. But JV, do, do you work out? Just what do you get up to? Are you still quite sporty? Yes, and I think having made four little children, uh, kept me in shape because uh, <laughs> okay. that we takes a lot of energy and time details. yeah no no the, the kids themselves <laughs> to, you know when they're growing up that really keeps you keeps you in shape now did you ever imagine that you would still be in the f1 paddock 21 years after winning the world championship no i really thought that once uh, i wouldn't have a steering wheel in my hands that, that would be it for, for for the paddock um because i didn't plan on not racing uh, after since 2006, really, uh, because it's only been a few races here and there, so that that was never part of, of the plan, and uh, I was never planning on speaking on TV either. So uh, the, the, you know, but life is full of surprises. So in 2006, when the Sauber thing came to an end, what was what was what was your plan? Were you going to go back to America or? No, I was planning on staying longer in Formula One. Uh, so it wasn't my choice to to stop. Um, but once that happened, uh, the, yeah, the, the idea was to go racing NASCAR. We uh, thought at the time that there were some opportunities that were not there. Now, you're one of a few racing drivers who admits to reading a book. That would suggest that there are other things that you could have done in your life other than being a racing driver. So let's wind the clock well, back. Reading a book is not really a career. <laughs> no, but it just, <laughs> it suggests that you have interests outside of racing, Jack. So, so first of all, why, why, why be a racing driver? I've always been passionate about racing and, and cars uh, and, and racetrack and everything that, that goes with it since I, I was five. Um, I used to play with little Hot Wheels uh, and Scalic Tricks and design racetracks and carpets. Uh, that's all that existed from morning to night. I never ever thought about doing anything else. So there, there was no choice, um, but it, it was my own uh, personal decision. It wasn't that no one else was, was giving you the choice or not. And I needed uh, to be in something competitive. And before car racing, it was skiing. And were you not tempted to try and pursue that as a career? No, no, because I always knew even back then that I would race in cars. So I never took skiing seriously enough, uh, you know, to have legs that are bigger than a tree. Uh, mostly in my, in my teen, teen years, um, I wasn't willing to sacrifice my teen, 
my teenage years to uh, to what was required for uh, for skiing, but only because I knew I was going to go car racing anyway. So was it a frustration for you that you didn't start karting like the rest of your contemporaries at the age of four? You were actually quite old when you came to it. Well, I didn't even know they were karting. Uh, I didn't really know what was going on with the sports. I was in boarding school, uh, skiing and studying. Uh, and I was just waiting for the, the opportunity. Um, and I thought at that time it would come once I turned 18 and I could start driving. And uh, luckily it started when I was 17 in Formula 3. And all the years skiing were actually very constructive and helpful for the driving. How? How did skiing help? Because psychologically it was a good preparation to sports, to competing, to pushing yourself, uh, to always finding a trick or a way to become better. That there's always someone that will beat you at some point. And what can you do? with your equipment, with yourself, with your attitude, with your approach, psychologically, putting the pressure on the others or not. That, that was all part of par and parcel of, of, of racing. That was the case in skiing a, a, as well. You needed to shine, and, and that was very useful in skiing, but also visually, because you, in skiing you're in a 3D space, uh, and awareness, that was good in cars. Um, and when you're skiing, you don't look at your skis. You don't look which position they're pointing. So you separate your vision to that, which doesn't happen in a car. And if you're in a car thing, you will always see your steering wheel in your hands. So having skied actually was very helpful to be able to drive a car when it got a little bit out of shape, or even in the rain when, uh, when you didn't have any visibility. So did you ever talk to your dad about becoming a racing driver? Not that I can remember. Of. I don't have that many memories with my dad, but it, it, all I know is that he was wanting his son, which was me, to race. Uh, obviously, there was no doubt uh, in his mind and the way I was brought up was only while I was with him was with him doing crazy stupid stuff either in a helicopter on his 4x4 or, or on the roads uh, that's the only image I had of him anyway Did you race him on skis? <clears throat> no, no because uh, by that time he wasn't really present in our lives anymore uh, the, the last two years of his life I was sent to live in another with another family the, the, the energy at home wasn't, wasn't good so it's not what was portrayed uh, so no, so I had the image of him as the racer and not as a dad. Okay, because the public perception is that you were out camping with mum and dad at the Formula The first one. year, that, was, that, was, that happened the first season or two and then it stopped. School became a little bit more important <laughs> at that point. <laughs> you, you learned to read a book. For example, was that in then, VLAR? Right? That was in VLAR in, in uh, Switzerland? No, no, that was, the, the, that was after, uh, we went to boarding school after, his, uh, after he passed away. Do you think you share many character traits with your dad? Some, yes, I, I think, uh, but I'm not sure why, because he didn't, we didn't discuss them or he wasn't present for, for me to, to, to learn it from them. But I, I did get from him a lot of respect for the risk and how do you push the risk and the risk of the, other, uh, the respect for the other competitors, because that was always very present uh, in his mind. And that's something that was uh, transferred somehow. I don't know if it was transferred through my mother or directly uh, through him while he was alive because I don't really have the memories. Okay, so you then... But you there was always a feeling that you had to push the limit and take the risks, not because it would allow you to go faster, but just so you could do, or do it while the others couldn't. You know, show who, who was the bigger wolf in the pack. That, that, that's all it was. And that, I think I got from him th while growing up. And I had it while I was skiing. You know, if we were going to, to jump cliffs, I would make sure I would jump the bigger cliff. Why? Just because the other ones wouldn't, wouldn't have the, the guts to do it and, and so on. So there was always a little bit uh, of that aspect and that was always present in, in my racing as well, like going through a rouge flat when nobody else was doing it. There, there was pride in it that didn't bring you any lap time. So it wasn't the pleasure of driving necessarily, but the thrill of competition and being prepared to do something that others, others weren't. A mixture of it all. Uh, well, you, that was part of it, but driving as well. I could just spend hours and hours driving around. Uh, that's something I've always loved, which was the same as skiing, which was the same as all these, uh, these uh, speed sports, where there was a, a limit, uh, where you had to live with that limit and that edge and figure it out. Because going fast in a straight line is quite useless. It's not speed in itself. It's how you evolve on that limit. How, how do you play with that limit? Right, so that brings me quite nicely onto IndyCar, because that's <laughs> a cup of tea just being poured. Well, I spent a lot of my racing career with Brits, 
Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I like to drink tea. <laughs> Frank Durney at Williams, yeah. of course, was a big uh, tea drinker, wasn't he? But, but Zach, so, so was IndyCar a good school for you ahead of Formula One? IndyCar was a great school. Uh, it was a great school because there was tremendous pressure, mostly when you have the Indy 500. Uh, there were tremendous speeds, so if you look at the ovals. Uh, so that was good preparation, and, and also the way you just worked on, on those big, heavy, fast, powerful cars. Uh, th there was a lot to do, a lot of development uh, as well. And there, there, there was such a difference in type of track, such, such a mix, road course, street course, bumpy, not bumpy, ovals, uh, that it, it really forced you to think a little bit out of the box which wasn't a habit for anyone in F1. So when I came to F1, that kind of thinking often helped. Hang on, I've got to follow up on that. So you think Formula One engineers don't think out of the box? Maybe in the design aspect, but not once you get on the racetrack and you set your car up. Um, I've been in some teams where, you know, I was just told, sit, sit down in the car and shut up and we know how to make the car go fast and that's it. So that's not really thinking out of the box. Uh, when I got to Williams, at first, uh, I started with, with Jock Clear, and it was his second season, so he was quite fresh as an engineer and very open-minded and willing to, to go in funny, strange directions. Uh, so, and, you know, the team, with all the testing we were doing, were, were happy to, to indulge in some of, some of my crazy ideas at times, and after a while, they realized that some of it was not that stupid. So that, that's what I meant with the thinking out of the box, is adapting while you're actually working and, and going in directions that maybe weren't part of the, the basic project, which wasn't really a habit in, in Formula One. And you learned, okay, so you learned those tricks in, champ, in IndyCar. Were you ever tempted just to stay in America? You had a nice life. You were the dominant guy. You'd won the Indy 500. Was there ever a part of you that said, I don't need uh, There was one? always the next challenge. Uh, after IndyCar, it was Formula One. That was always the ultimate goal. Uh, and... Uh, when you get a call from Williams, you'd be the biggest idiot in the world to say no to that. You, you can't. You, you get, you get a dream chance. Uh, you know, you have at the time you had Williams, and well, I guess you had Ferrari because Ferrari is also the team. It's you know, it's Formula One, but Williams was the best team. Uh, you know, I was I was always a big fan of Nigel, and so when, when he saw him win there, and so the, the 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 whole history with the team, and also to be able to get in a team that you know is fighting. To stay as to, to, to remain the best team, uh, with the, the with the um, with the people that will allow you to experiment, um, and that was that's just exciting. Where was the first contact made? Did they ring you? Did they ring your manager Craig Pollock? Did they? Oh, it happened through management and through Craig, right. and uh, I really don't know how everything happened. All, all I remember is uh, we had the race in Michigan, and then I just jumped in a plane to go testing. At Silverstone? At Silverstone, and that was a big shock. I was there at that first test. First time I'd seen you in the flesh. Why was that a shock? Just the car was so different? The, the, the car didn't have power compared to IndyCar, so that wasn't a surprise. It plateaued, so that, that, wasn't, that didn't feel special. It's just how nervous and light and nimble and how everything happened fast. That, uh, it, it, it's the same as putting fast forward. You know, watch a movie and put it in fast forward, and that's what Formula One was. Suddenly, it was a huge step. And, and your brain is not used to that at first. So it takes a day to, to figure it out and you're just tired because of all the information that assails your brain. Uh, but then you sleep on it and then everything slows down for the following day. And were you surprised at the attention you got? The amount of attention you got? I remember there being a huge press gathering at that test. At I didn't pay much attention to it because it had always been like that. Uh, you know, when I started in Formula 3, I got a lot of attention and I'd never raced in my life. So I was used to to starting without the knowledge, getting the attention and having to perform under that kind of pressure. And it was always perform or go home, uh, which was, uh, it made it stressful, but it then forced me to learn fast, to, to, to get on with the program. And, and it taught me to perform with pressure as well, which was so useful at the Indy 500 and also in Formula One. You were 24 when you came over to Formula One. By today's standards, that's super old. <laughs> <laughs> that is an old man. And back then, I, I was told that I was too young. So uh, times has changed. Who, who told you? I mean, oh, that was the general talk. Uh, you know, I was on the young side to get into F1. Um, and I suppose Damon, your teammate, was in his 30s, wasn't he? He was in his mid 30s. Yeah, probably. but that was great. It was great. I had a teammate, teammate like Damon, with so much experience and that I respected because then. I could look, look up to him and, and learn, learn from him. And, and that was super important. 
How was the relationship with Damon? It was very professional. We always got along. There were moments of electricity, obviously, because uh, I kept pushing back his championship win during the season, which didn't agree with him, obviously. Uh, so that, that was fun. But it was always very respectful, and we always got, got along. So the, you know, the, 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 I was lucky to, to have him as a, as a teammate. It was a really good, good learning year. Any psychological games between you? Because the reason I say that, he told me a story once that he was sitting down to have dinner and you nicked his dinner or something like that. And that really annoyed well, him. Well, he had a nice piece of chicken that looked really nice. So I uh, just wasn't thinking about it. And I was super hungry and starving. So yeah, I, the, it wasn't as bad as, it, as he makes it sound. Um, and no, it wasn't a political game. The, 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 the only games that happened were on the racetrack, trying to beat each other out. But nothing ever happened outside the, of, of the, the racetrack. That was actually, on the political side, the easiest season uh, I had in Formula 1. Even compared to Heinz Harold in year two? Yes, because when Heinz Harold was signed... Uh, he, Heinz Harold Frensen, of course. Frensen, yeah. he was signed by the team and, and announced as the, the next champion for Williams. So How did that it make started, you feel? The, 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 well, it, it, it made me feel that I had to, uh, to destroy him. Uh, in and out of the car, uh, and then and that was it. And then so the, the 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 battle started, and and it went my direction. That was a super quick car, that '97 car, wasn't it? it? It was super quick, and it suited me. It was designed around me. Uh, it was designed with, with all the input I put in '96. And Adrian knew he was really good at understanding drivers, drivers he respected. If you he, because he, he was a magician with cars, and sometimes he made cars that drivers didn't like. But if if you could have respect and, and a good relationship, then, then you could kind of steer a little bit in, 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 in the direction. And that car was second skin for me. I could do whatever I wanted with it, almost all the time. There were just tracks where it would low downfalls, like Montreal, where the car was a little bit nasty. It got out of the window too easily. But most of the time, you could get into quality, put new tires, and you knew you could go half a second faster. You could push it, and somehow it would work out. How quickly did your attention that year turn from Frentzen to Michael Schumacher? How quickly did it become? Ah, first a race. <laughs> first race. First race because he was P2 in quality two seconds off. Um, I don't need to worry about him. That's what. No, no, that, 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 that was damaging. That, 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 that was damaging. And then he blew his brakes because uh, Ed, Eddie Irvine ran into me and in, in, in breaking turn one. Um, and, 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 and that was it. And he, then he was leading the, the race and blew, blew his brakes. But that, that two second in qualifying was, was very hurtful. I don't think that happened often in the dry anyway in Formula 1. So that was, uh, uh, it was a little bit more difficult afterwards. He found his way, but that, that, that was an important one. Crazy stat about that 97 season is that you and Schumacher did not share a podium at any point. Well, we never raced all year until Harris. The only time we're on the track, side by side, or in, in, in a fighting situation, was Harris out of the whole season. That's the weirdest thing. But I mean, okay, if you're not even having an on-track battle, but at least you'd have thought you'd have ended up on, in the top three together. But what a crazy season that was. It, it was a crazy season that at, after a few races, people thought, okay, Williams has won this. And uh, we went a little bit to sleep, even as a team, because Adrian knew he was leaving the team. Uh, so there was a change of guard as well in, in the design office. Uh, and then Ferrari really reacted. They found tremendous traction somehow uh, from 96, but then it really improved in 97. And they became super fast out, out, out of blue. And uh, we fought back. And halfway through the season, everybody was saying that, okay, Ferrari has won this championship. There's no way Williams can come back. And, and we fought back. So that, 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 that was fun. Now, who, uh, we, you've discussed Jerez at length, um, and I'm not going to do it now, but what I do want to ask you, is who was the fastest driver you ever raced in your career? Fastest in pure speed? I don't know, because the... What's that Michael Schumacher? The fiercest, uh, because of his antics as well. Um, you knew that the chance of it ending in tears were almost uh, every time you would fight with him. So, but there were also the best battles, even in 96, overtaking him in Estrell on the outside. So there were always m memorable moments. There was not one battle with Michael that was not memorable. Um, so he's the one I will probably remember the most as a, as a, in a fighting situation. The greatest competitor, if you like. But I mean, if I throw some names at you and say Hakkinen, Mika Hakkinen. Don't know, because he was a splash. 
I, I, I really don't know. It looks like he lost interest after winning his two championships. Um, and I don't remember fighting him on the track uh, because once he got into a winning car, we weren't in the battle anymore. So I was never actually uh, at, at a good speed when he was winning. So I have, so I have no idea how quick he, he was. Fernando Alonso? Oh, yeah, I had him as a teammate for three races, and that's probably uh, the most impressive teammate I had race-wise. race, race wise. Uh, Qualifying was fine, but in the race, uh, he had some kind of energy in him that really pushed you in your trenches. Uh, so those three races were really, really constructive as well. Uh, and it was fun and, uh, you know, a, a great racer. Uh, and, and you see it, he never gives up. He, no, he never gives an inch. There's, there's not one race, doesn't matter what position he's fighting for, that where he gives an inch. But you hadn't raced up until those last handful of races at the end of 2004. So you weren't match fit. If you'd been, or is, is, that, is that a correct statement? Were you match fit? Were you at the height of your powers when you went up against Alonso? Well, I'd been out for six months yeah. uh, and I had driven and... Uh, it was tough because those cars were the f most physical I'd ever driven. Um, it, it was surprising. It was a big shock. And uh, but uh, speed-wise, we, we were in qualifying were 50-50, so so it was fine. Um, and, and then in the race, it, it, it took me a couple of races to get that last tenth or two to, to be on, on on par with him, which then happened uh, uh, by the end. But it always took me a few laps to to figure it out, and I always I always had to base. Uh, my laps on him, realizing how, how quick he was and then fi finding ways. And also the Renault was designed around him. By the time we got to Brazil, we had changed the setup completely and it suited me and it was a lot of fun. I wish I'd, I could have done a full season against him because that, that would have been exciting. I wonder if then we would have remained friends or not because those three races, he was amazing. He was very respectful and very helpful. Uh, but then when you see the season against Lewis, the, the, the same respect was not there. It became a, a, a battle of wills. Um, so I, I would have loved to have, I think I could have learned a lot from him, uh, just with his fierce approach. When were you then at the height of your powers? When were you at your best as a racing driver? I think the, 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 the years in BAR uh, were great because I, I, the team built around me. Well, you know, I owned the team so, uh, and I built it, so that, that was normal. And the driving we, we did then as, as a team, it didn't show on results. But it was great. It wasn't actually as bad as people say. Mostly when, when you look that we, we first season we kept getting P8s, which today would have been amazing points in the first season. And back then it was like, what a bunch of losers. Look, they're only eighth. So times have changed on how good you need to be to be respectfully good. Now you get a top 10 and, well, that's great. Even when Alonso gets a ninth or 10th in, in the McLaren, people think, it, think it's, it's amazing. So uh, it was more negative or the perception was more negative than it should have been. But it was also self-induced because uh, the team, or I think it was Adrian Reynard at the time, came out with, we will make pole in our first race and fight for the championship. And I think that just got everybody angry in the paddock. And then they just deci decided to pounce on us and we became the laughing stock, which, which I understand. Can I take you back about, and ask you about that decision to go, to do the BAR thing? Because uh, do you regret it in hindsight? Uh, what other options were on the table at the time? No, I don't, I don't regret it because uh, how many drivers have built their own, their own F1 teams? Uh, not many. So it was the next project. It was the next challenge. So that was good. And it was going the right way. Second season, we got podiums. So that looked okay. And, and then politics started to kick in with Honda. Uh, with David Richards being there and me protecting Craig. So David Richards decided that I was part of that battle and, uh, and, and I lost out in there, which was, which was frustrating. When I, when I did the team, um, I ju just before doing, doing the team or sometimes during the summer, I got a call from Adrian Newey you know, telling me, okay, don't do the team because we want you here in McLaren. But when he called me, I was sitting in front of Craig. Um, I was sitting in front of Craig I know it sounds, it sounds bad because that could have mean more championships, but you never know. Maybe I would have had an accident and passed away. So you, you can't just say it would have been better. You just never know. You only know what you've had, not what you would have gotten. So you have, you have to be careful with that. Uh, and my relationship with Ron was always a, a little bit tensed anyway. So it could have been complicated. Uh, but I, had, he, had Adrian called me an hour earlier or two hours later, then I could have had an open discussion with him. And the chances are I probably would have gone with McLaren. But with Craig sit sitting in front of me, I could not get into the conversation. So I just cut it short and, and that was it. Was that 499? 
That was 499, correct, so, as we were building the team. And, so, and, I, and the team was only built if there was a world champion being part of it, which, which was me. So either during that dinner I was saying, okay, we move forward with it, or there was no team. So there was no time to, to react. And you know, with Craig just sitting in front of me, I couldn't say to Adrian, oh yeah, let's talk about the option and this. So, so it was just you know, a couple of, couple of hours in that phone call that made the whole difference. But I still don't totally understand the motivation for BAR because you're a racing driver, your business is winning races, winning championships, and you knew that it would at least initially be a step back. That's okay. You, you can have a, I still have plenty of years ahead of me. So it's okay to have two or three difficult years. Uh, we had a great big sponsor, um, building a great factory. It's, it's Mercedes today. It's the same factory. So you can't tell me it was a bad plan. Uh, I'm not saying it was a bad plan, except you I are love a racing driver. Okay. And I've never done things the way they're written or the way they're supposed to be. Even my, my path to Formula One. After three years in, in, in Formula Three in Italy, the, the, the plan was to go to 3000. That looked complicated. So the plan was to do one more Formula Three season to then go to 3000. And, and I got a call to go to Japan. Normally drivers who went to Japan is because there was no more opportunities in, in Europe. And I just woke up and said, oh, okay, screw that, let's go. Uh, it's, it, that's, that looks like fun. It will be very constructive. And that was the, uh, the, the, the best move I made. Uh, that allowed me then to get into Formula One. So no, the, the written path is not necessarily the best one. And it's never the, ones I, the one I've followed, never in my career anyway. So there, there was this great opportunity. Uh, big sponsor willing to put the cards on the table to build uh, a potentially winning team. And it is now a team that... Is, is destroying records. Uh, so it was a great project. The issue is the politics started and, um, and, and, and that killed it and I chose the wrong side. Well, if, can, can we elaborate on that? Because if you were embarking on that BAR project now with 20 more years of life experience, Formula One experience, what would you do differently? Well, when David Richards came in, I would have said, thank you, Craig, but you need to move on now. That's it. Instead of protecting and, and fighting for Craig, when obviously uh, those days were gone. And then that's, uh, that, that's what destroyed the, the whole uh, relationship and, uh, and put me on the wrong side of, of David Richards at, at that point. Um, the, but, uh, you know, at the same time, I had built everything with Craig. So, uh, and he had a little bit of a, it was a little bit of a father figure as well. And he was using that to kind of push in certain direction. And I felt that I had to prove to him that uh, he had my trust. So that's when the decision started to be wrong uh, because the second contract, when I stayed with BAR, I had the copy contract given to me by Flavio because uh, Briatore, because uh, Renault was, was wanting me. And um, I was going to sign the Renault contract. I remember I was sitting with, with Jock and we were discussing and, and uh, Jock was coming along as well. And I was signing the contract, but then you know, Craig was in tears and said, you know, if, if you don't stay with BAR, the whole project dive bombs, it dies, and, and I lose my jobs. And that suddenly my hand moved from one contract to the other. And that was the first time that I didn't follow my own instinct, that I, I didn't do what I was wanting to do. Ever. In life? In, uh, in racing, let's say, or in life. Yeah, in life as well, in, in racing and life. So that, and then, then I just paid the price and, and that's life. Is it true that your dad wanted to set up his own team back in the day? Well, he tried. He, he tried. Uh, I think Jody Schechter was involved as well. Uh, but then the, the, the money wasn't there, so it didn't work out. But for, uh, I don't have all the information, but uh, he was working on it. Somewhere deep down in the back of your mind, was there unfinished business? And, and I, I didn't know that until after I did BAR. I wasn't uh, even told about it. But there's so many things now I find out that I either do like my dad or think in the same way, and I have no reason of knowing. Uh, I didn't grow up with them. So there has to be something in the genes somewhere because uh, sometimes I'm told things or situations. I say, oh, well, that's weird because I never knew about them. So the BAL project came to an end. Then you, you, you did the Renault thing, which we've discussed, and then the Sauber thing. How, diff how much did you miss racing in Formula One when the Sauber project came to an end? Oh, the, that was a big downer. I wasn't ready to stop. I was still driving well. I was still, I still had a lot to give. And, and I was even making a huge effort to be more social with the team. And that's when I started being 
treated badly. So it didn't really pay off. It, it looks like the bigger asshole you are, the, the, the best they treat you. It, it's really weird. So that, 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 that wasn't good. But uh, the whole Sauber thing was, was weird because um, when, when, when I was in discussion with uh, P Peter Sauber, um, at the same time, I, I got a call from a friend who said, listen, g give a ring to Flavio because Trulli is getting the sack. And uh, so I quickly called Flavio and he said, no, you can't. Sorry, we have to put Montagne in the car. He's our third driver because I think he was under contract with Flavio as well. So at that point, I called Patrick Fall, who was running Renault. And within an hour, Flavio called me back angry, saying, How, why did you call behind my back? Okay, come and make your seat tonight. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that was cool. But then uh, Peter Sauber didn't want me to go and drive for, uh, for uh, Renault because he was wanting to be the one bringing me back to Formula One and not Renault. So at that point, I told him, listen, I'll bring, I'll bring the Michelin tires to the team if I can do those three races because uh, Renault was with Michelin. And he said, it's impossible. We already talked with Michelin. Uh, the tires are just not available. They already have too many teams uh, in Formula One. And in the end, he allowed me to do it, and I brought Michelin to the team as well. So, uh, you know, that, that made me feel good. But then at some point, BMW bought the, bought the team, and I got a call saying, listen, we don't want you in the team. Go, go in court and fight with our lawyers or change your contract. So I said, oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so, so Jacques, what, what happens? I mean, when you, when you are forced out of a situation, and you know, there's all the adrenaline as well that comes with, with racing in Formula One. Just talk us through that time and how difficult it was. And did you, was there a bit of cold turkey going on? What, how, did you, how did you keep yourself busy? And Well, the, the minute that happened and I thought, okay, let's go to the States. Let's go NASCAR racing. That, that would be the next challenge. Uh, and no, but it had to be racing. The oh yeah, no, no, it had to be racing. I, I'm, I'm, even today, I need somehow to be happy, I need a steering wheel in my hands. So of course, you're still you're doing the World Rally Cross. Well, they will, uh, I'll be doing the American ra Rally Cross series, but it, same cars. Uh, but uh, yes, I need a steering wheel. It's it's just stronger than me. Uh, I need competition. I need I need to push myself. I need to 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 get into that situation where you get in your bubble and you do and you feel you're doing something special. So you said earlier on that. You didn't really talk to your dad about this, which makes me think it, you know, it's the whole nature versus nurture thing. Any of your kids showing a, a little no, bit of no, flair for racing? No, because they've, they've only seen me TV commentate, not drive, and that's a big difference. Because for them, it's, it's a history. You know, their dad was a racer, but they cannot relate to it. Because um, it's not something they grew up with. They didn't feel the excitement of it. So it's a little bit different, uh, but they're, they're into sport. They're hockey players, they're skiers. So the, the, it, 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 they, there's something in the genes anyway, uh, just not in, into car racing. And it's not something I've really pushed or emphasized to them because I don't see it as a good uh, career choice anymore because you almost need to be in the, uh, in the ranks of stroll to get into racing and it's not, talent that drives the force of drivers getting into racing anymore. Even for go-kart, they're spending two, three hundred thousand euros just to go in go-karts to have a Formula One truck. And there, the money makes more difference than the actual talent. So if already at 12, 13, 14 years old, the money will make the difference, the talent will never shine, will never get through the ranks. So you'll get the best out of the Formula 2 drivers, you get the best of the rich kids. You don't get the best talent available on the planet. The Villeneuve name would open a few doors, surely? Probably, uh, probably, but I know what it comes from as well. The, the, the amount of pressure and stress. Um, and if there's one of them that shows pure passion, like I had, fine, then I'll give a helping hand. When I was 15, 16, uh, I was a mechanic in a racing school just so I could do a few laps in a race car, uh, the Spinar David in Ontario. That, that did, these were the first races I did uh, instead of being on summer holiday, and that was after being at boarding school. You know, it probably would have been nicer to, be, to have been at home and, and because when you're in boarding school, you're away from everything and away from your family. So and, and instead, I prefer to be in another kind of boarding situation so I could be a, a mechanic. So unless you have that kind of, of passion, there is no point getting into this just because you'll be jet set and a star. It, it's the wrong uh, attitude to have. Uh, out of the four kids, the, the little one, the four-year-old sleeps with cars, so I might be in trouble with him at some point. <laughs> What's his name? Just so we... uh, Henry. Henry. Henry, which was my dad's middle name. 
That's really nice. So maybe that's why, I don't know. <laughs> and, and, and you and the kids are all living back in Vilan now, is that right? Yes, all living in the mountains, which, which is why they're in two sports as well. So living in the town would be a little bit more complicated. Now you say that becoming a racing driver isn't perhaps a great career choice, but it did you pretty well. And Jack, <laughs> because back then you could still make it. You still had tobacco sponsors uh, that, were, that were helping, that gave, I don't know if you remember all the f racing schools in France. Winfield. The Winfield, the, all the challenges. And uh, most French drivers, Prost and Panis, got into F1 through uh, those schools. So you arrived there, gave a little bit of money, and it was a challenge. And, and all the way to finals. And if you won, you got a seat in Formula 4, Formula 3. And if you kept winning, then you kept being followed. And that gave kids who had a lot of talent and passion, but not the means, maybe a, even if it was a small chance, a chance. You don't even have that today. Like you have to spend 300,000 euros for karting? Come on. It's not, it, it shouldn't be Christmas every day. Racing should not be Christmas. You should be able to live in a tent and figure it out and figure, figuring a way to be good enough to go through the ranks until the point where you have enough image that the sponsor or team will take a chance of you. Now, teams will sign a few drivers when they're 12 and then try to build them, to make them, to make them into good drivers. That's, that's wrong. How much did you enjoy your career in Formula One? Oh, I loved it. I mean, Jack, you were, sorry to interrupt, but you were the peroxide rebel. You still are, actually. <laughs> Looking yeah, at you I, across the I, table. I feel, my, I, feel, uh, you know, I feel more myself. Since, when, since I've gone back peroxide, people say, oh, hi. And uh, a lot of people I met through the years say, oh, you're not blonde. Like, think I, well, I really was blonde, so yeah. But Jack, you were the peroxide rebel. You owned a nightclub in Montreal. Bernie loved you. It was... Um, it was great times, wasn't it? I had fun. I was at the end of an era, I think. It was in the 70s, where you could still have fun. You could still be... I wouldn't say I was a rebel, because a rebel goes against the establishment just for the sake of it, not because he believes in something. A rebel doesn't necessarily believe in something, so that, that's a little bit different. Uh, I was always my man. Uh, I, always, I always had big beliefs, strong beliefs in what was right, what was wrong. And if something was right, I would go with it. If something was wrong, that I, I would voice it. It was always very difficult for me to take a step back. Uh, and I think that, that was apparent. And life, you have to live life. Uh, there's consequences to everything you do, and you have to be aware of that. And you shouldn't make other people pay for your consequences. That, that's the fine line that you have to, to, to walk and where, where you draw it. But you have to live it to the maximum and, and you know, changing your hair color, that's just fun. And it gets people writing stories about, okay, now he's lost his marbles and psychologically is destroyed, that it's, look, he did his hair, that means he's completely lost it. And that just made me laugh. <laughs> what did Patrick Head say to you when he walked into the garage with blonde hair the first time? Actually, the team didn't react. Honestly, they I think- They all put wigs on. I remember them all with wigs on. Yes, at, at the last, yeah, because it, that's also, I remember last race, uh, all the Renault people had made some blonde, wigs that they were wearing when I was on the podium. So it, it, it made it even more historical or fun because it, then it, 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 as a bunch, we all got attached and, and that was great. But I guess but that, by that time, Williams was used to me. Uh, that uh, all they cared was the driving, the racing, win or not, and don't embarrass the team. Have you got any good Patrick Head stories that you can share? I mean, you're both <laughs> quite punchy characters. Yeah, we, we, we got along actually. Yeah. There was tremendous respect because I stood up to him, but he respected my point of view. So there was a little bit of, it was feisty, but at the same time, Patrick liked that. That's what he needed. He needed someone that stood up to him, but at the same time, we would listen to each other and capable of going back thinking, hey, okay, maybe he's right, maybe he's not. But the, 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 no, the one thing I remember, he was really advocate of going softer and softer and softer. I don't know why, at that point, we had to go softer. Uh, it became his new mantra with anti-roll bars. So for 97, we changed the lettering on the bars so that he believed they were softer. Uh, and, and it worked out. And, 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 and they were the same. Oh yeah, yeah, we just, yeah. So, so that, that, that worked out and then, and, and, and it was fun because the way the car worked, the, the way the car was designed, even aerodynamically, even if mechanically it wasn't the best thing, it, it really helped. And, and, you, and I, I always like to have a very light rear end, a very pointy car. And back then, with the way the tires were working, you could drive like that. Uh, and, and that's how we managed to, to do some, some amazing pole positions because 
you could go that extra mile always. And, and, and then in the race, we could manage it because uh, we were good on, on our tires. We didn't blister them when Ferrari was blistering their tires. So, so, so that, was, that was fun. And, and when Patrick saw that I was standing up to him, then instead he went uh, on Heinz Harald and Heinz Harald just melted. Couldn't. Yeah, he melted. He melted. So did drivers, it seems that the drivers had more fun back in your day than they do now. Is that well, fair? I fun? had, anyway. Um, who, who was yes, your wingman? No, we did, because, listen, when I got into F1, it was only the start of cell phones, for example. You didn't have pictures, you didn't have, you could have a laugh, you, you could joke, you, could, you, could, you didn't have to be politically correct yet, even in, in, your, in your commentaries, even if in your answers. It was about, it was starting, but you could. You could say things, you could have fun, you could be a little bit aggressive, you could, uh, if someone blocked you on the track, you would wait one lap, blocked him, that was it. There, there was some man-to-man -man, uh, reaction, action. And it wasn't a question of, okay, I'll put you in the wall. If I don't get caught, I won't be pun penalized, and that's it, And like you see now. So you didn't have, I think Michael was the first one to start the weaving down the straight and then putting you in the wall, and then truly was one of those came, coming from karting. But before them, nobody ever did it. There was respect. You, you went for the move or you didn't. You went on the inside and you stayed there. You weren't weaving. So there, there was always that kind of respect. So you could get out of, this car, of the car, scream at each other for five minutes and then have a cup of coffee or whatever and it was fun. So, so there was a camaraderie off track? Yes, because it was still an era where there was a certain amount of danger. Uh, and you still felt that you were a group doing something special that no others could do. Do you think that has been lost today? By implication yes, in your yes, voice. Yes, when an 18-year-old can jump into an F1 and within 10 laps be within a tenth or two of the best drivers, that's wrong. Back then, you, if, if, if within a half a day you were within a half a second, or, yeah, you were happy. If you were within a second, you were happy. I mean, I got an F1 from Indy cars, cars that were super fast, and it was tough. The last, I was a second away in the first day of testing, and I was lost. Um, today, if you're, sec if you're two tenths away, you think, oh, okay, that wasn't good after 10 laps. So that, 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 that's wrong. Something, the cars are faster than ever, but you look at them, they're, they're complex to drive because of all the, the manipulations they have to do on the steering wheel and how they have to change everything. But the pure driving, the car is very nimble, stable, and in the race, they drive, what, 80% of the capacity just to massage the heat in the tires, massage the engine, massage everything. So that's changed a lot. You're quite an outspoken pundit now, aren't you? Well, are, are I've you always a... been outspoken. Yeah. Is it a conscious thing? No. No, I've, all my life I've been like that. In school, uh, in class, if something uh, happened that wasn't fair, even to another kid, I, I would stand up and, and, and just fight for him, even if it's someone I didn't like. I don't know, it's just natural. It's stronger than me, and at some point I'll see red. Uh, when something is really unfair, I just can't hold it in. I don't know why. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so sometimes, uh, so sometimes it, it, it was costly, but over the years, it turns out that it's actually been more positive than the negative. Because now people know that whatever comes out, it's what I tr what's inside. It's, it's not uh, constructed uh, or invented. Just as a result of that attitude, do you feel that any of the current drivers have an issue with you? Or do you feel that it's nothing less than they expect and it washes off and... Maybe a couple, but in general, in general, hopefully they also hear the, co the positive comments. The problem is only the negative ones get brought. You get a piece of paper, uh, look at what's been said. And there could be one negative, but 10 positives. And the 10 positives don't get brought, or they're non-existent. And that, that, that's, that's an issue. But as it turns out, um, no, because there's time. There's time now with the media, or even on TV, to, to explain, to, to construct what you're saying. It's not just spitting it out without meaning. They, you, have to, you have to also say it in a way that people can think about it. Yes, no, he's right, he's wrong. But you need the full explanation. Which of the current grid is most like you? Which driver? I don't know. I don't think. Uh, I don't think you see Lewis? really who, who who they are. Is Lewis like you were? Mm, no, I, I I don't think so. He, he spends a lot of time working on his image. It's paramount, and it's not something we did back then. You know, the team was doing your image, and you just drove and had fun. 
that's very, very, very different. Um, so I, I really don't think so, no. Um, and we didn't have social media back then, so it's very difficult to compare why things are done. Alonso? Alonso? I would say more Alonso, yes. He, he speaks definitely. his mind, doesn't he? Yes, he speaks his mind, but he knows, he knows it gets out. But yes, um, he, he's one of the old guard. He's one of the last Mohicans, and uh, he does uh, speak in mind. And lately, Kimi has been very outspoken as well. He makes quite, full quite phrases. Chatty now. Yeah, yeah, he's very chatty. He makes full phrases, and they're coherent. So, uh, uh, and I think you see more who he is now than, than in the past. And he's also doing his best driving this way. I think having a kid, sometimes people will say, okay, when you, have a, you lose one second per kid. And with Kimi, uh, it looks more like he's been gaining and, uh, and, and his work is better having kids. Why do you think that is? Maybe it gave him a reason in life to do something positive, to, to become better at something, to show, uh, I don't know, but it, it seems to have tied the line. Um, you never know what will affect you psychologically. And, and then sometimes the most unlikely situations will have either an adverse effect or a positive one. And it, you, you never know how it will turn out. So would you, do, you, do you think Kimi deserves another year at Ferrari in 2019? Well, of course. Look at, at the work he's been doing. He's third in the championship. He's often quicker than Vettel. When he's not, he's, what, a tenth behind? He's paramount in the dev development of the car. Uh, the whole team works fantastically well now. Uh, put... Put a young cub next to Vettel, what will Vettel do? We'll try to eat him alive. And either he will destroy the young cub or it will end in tears in the team and the whole team will end up going slower within two years. So that's not constructive. So you wouldn't put Charles Leclerc in? Not for one more year, no. And, and Charles is still making a few mistakes. It would be great for Leclerc. It would be amazing for him, but it would be two years of Ferrari preparing him. And Ferrari... Is not, it's like Mercedes, it's not a team to prepare drivers. It's a top team, top teams, they buy and they pay for the drivers when they're at their best and when they want them. Uh, and that's why you have junior teams, to prepare them. If you were Fernando Alonso, what would you do next year? Well, what can he do? That's the first question, because everybody talks as if he, he had the choice. I don't think he has. He's done damage at Ferrari when he left. The whole paddock saw that. Um, and the whole paddock hears his comments. Uh, with Honda and so on, and they're a little bit afraid of him. He's an amazing racer, but he can do damage as well. So, and where do you go? Where, where do you go that's better than where he's at now? There's nothing available. Uh, if I was Alonso, I would go IndyCar and try and win the Indy 500 to, to get the Triple Crown. Race a whole season of IndyCar, leave Formula One behind. Well, definitely, because imagine more seasons like this year, at some point he will damage his image. Because there was the excuse of, of Honda until now. <laughs> That excuse is gone. Now, you, you're talking so passionately about Formula One still. Tell me what interests you have away from motorsport. Oh, plenty. Um, life is interesting. So, uh, sports, I, I play hockey. And you, you played hockey as a kid, right? No, I didn't play really as a kid. I played when I was in F1, made my own team. I was still ski racing, I had a license until 2006. So I, I still do a little bit of that. So that's on the sports side. Um, music, I like composing, writing. Uh, so you're still doing that because of course you released, what was it, yeah, 10 years ago? Yeah, but now with four kids that kind of took the time away from, yeah. from that because you need your space for hours to do that. And that's just not possible now. I've designed a racetrack, but the racetrack in Canada, so uh, near Vancouver. So that's been a a, a great challenge and that's been fun and I still love I still love everything uh, you know, like you were talking about reading before all the fantasy like Tolkien and, and science fiction and, and to really get into the, those books because there's often a, a social aspect to them that makes you think about today's society and that's that's really interesting uh, to read and I'm big into vintage computers as well vintage computing and sorry so yeah <laughs> that, a little bit of everything is, that is quite random Vintage computers. Yes, from the 70s and 80s, you know, the stuff I grew up with. And so you, you never work. throw a laptop away, you keep them all? No, that's modern. I mean, really, really vintage. So uh, it's, uh, it's really exciting when, when, when you'll get a game running from the 70s to see what, how clever the programmers were. You know, it's as if you had amazing games despite the lack of technology, and today you have amazing game despite the terrible programming. And then, then I find that I'm, I'm very curious about it. That's all. 
you were a big gamer, is that right? Yes, uh, yes as well. Um, well, since a kid. So I programmed games when I was 12 as well. So I was always uh, into that. Um, and you know, it's cool. What I really liked were physics and, and maths. That, these were my, my main subjects and languages, obviously. And having been a gamer, programming games and all that has been very useful also in racing. Because when I started in F1, yes, you had technology and telemetry, but you still worked one-on-one -on -one with your engineer. And then you kind of used the technology and you could come up with ideas. It was very useful to have this mindset. Uh, and that was very helpful. And I carried on. And after that, it was all the online gaming because suddenly you could close yourself off from the real world and you could have respect inside this imaginary world from people who didn't know who you were. People didn't know that you were a world champion or a Formula 1 racer. And, and, that, and that, that, that was great. What was your online name? Oh, uh, my main character was called Hudderman. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, it was all in fantasy world. It was in Dark Ages of Camelot. A lot of people were playing uh, that game, and you know, I would often run the raids where 100 people would follow you to go kill the dragon that takes, took six hours, and you had to lead your little army. So that was fun. That was fun because they had no idea, idea who I was. And on the server, I became the main guy to run all these things. And they would just sit online and wait until I showed up so we could do all these things. So that was super exciting. And I even got the internet installed in BAR back then in, in the truck. So when there was some time off in the evening, I could... They thought you were working the, uh, on setup, didn't they? No, 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 definitely <laughs> not. They, they knew I wasn't. <laughs> now, it's interesting that you're still living in Europe. I mean, you say you designed the racetrack in Canada, but but it's for, you're very much European. No, no temptation to take the family to well, Quebec? I did or? go back to live in Montreal for five years and because I had this memory of the Quebec of my childhood, but it's, it's changed and I've changed. Uh, you know, I've lived in Japan, I've lived all around the planet. Uh, right now I've been, what, five years in Switzerland. I think that's the record of me being anywhere. I've never lived longer than that anywhere all throughout my life. So it's uh, a little bit strange. Um, but it's it, Switzerland it, home now? Yeah, Switzerland is right now, but you know, we live on a big planet. There's so many amazing places. You cannot just stay in one place. What's still on the list? Tell me about your travel plans. Oh, I don't know. Uh, you know. Once you have kids, it kind of slows you down a bit on, on the moving thing. When you're alone and just with a backpack, it, it makes yeah. life a lot easier. You've never backpacked no, around not, the world. No, 20 years ago, you could just take a luggage and move yeah. and figure it out once you got there. You can't do that anymore. But I mean, is there, is there south, somewhere in South America? Do you, do you like nature? Do you want to go and climb mountains? Do you want to go and dive no, in the... No, I, 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 I do like Europe. I still, Japan is a place I would go back to, but I do like Europe. There's so many cultures in such a little area. Uh, you can never get bored. And then, you know, it's, it's our origins. Uh, it's, uh, there's well, no, a lot you, of history. But your origins are Quebec. Yes, but with, you know, blood from, uh, from France, France, and oh, actually, well, we also have some, some maybe sixth generation, we're Sioux or Sioux or Iroquois, or so we have some Indian blood as well. So we're a little bit from everywhere. So look, Jack, what does the future hold? You seem really happy. Just uh, the last forty-five minutes or so, it, you, you you seem in a good place. Yeah. Yes. In, uh, in your life. Yes. I, I just not enough driving. That that's the that's the only thing missing. Everything else is perfect. So it's just. You know, one or two races a year is just not enough because you cannot work on a, pro on, a, on a project. You're always a little bit behind. I had a blast in Rallycross. I had a blast in NASCAR. That, that's really one sour point for me is that I never got the chance to do full proper season uh, in, in NASCAR because that, that was exciting and tremendous fun. Why not? You're only 47. Um, well, just... Decisions as well. At that time, I was still working with, with Craig. And when, when, when I left Europe is because there were these amazing contracts waiting in NASCAR, and they weren't. Uh, so I moved the family, moved everyone to, to, to Canada. And at, this, at that point, it would have been good if someone explained to me that you have to move to Charlotte, not to Canada. You need to be near the teams. Because I, I didn't know about NASCAR and what was the mentality. And you need to be there. You need to be with, it, with everyone. So that, that was one wrong move. And then when... Uh, um, the, the, the Gillette made their NASCAR team. They were the owners of the hockey team, the Montreal, the Canadian Montreal uh, hockey team. Um, had a call with, with the, through a friend from the owners saying, okay, we're building a team. It's not official yet, but we want you in the team. So obviously I pushed it towards Craig and the comments that came back is, no, that team doesn't want you. 
uh, it's not good, it won't happen. So, really, okay, too bad. So they put Carpentier in the car, and I found out a year later that he said, well, why didn't you call us back? Why didn't you, because, you know, you were our driver. So that, that kind of was hard to swallow. So what could you race? I just want to establish this before oh, we go. Oh. I mean, what about the, the World Rally Cross? Could you do a season of that? Who is, Subaru is who you're doing the thing yes, with. Yes, and that's right? in the American series, which, yeah. which is great. It, it doesn't have too many races, so it, it allows me to, uh, to carry on what I'm doing here in, in the Formula 1 paddock, the TV commentary, which is actually, I'm surprised, I'm surprised at how exciting and fun this is. I never expected it to be as enjoyable, so, so that's great. What, do, do you find it live TV and an adrenaline rush? Yes, it is. It is, because you always think, oh, when you sit on your couch, you, you watch sports and you commentate with your friends but you'll spend 10 minutes saying nothing. That's not the same when you're in the commentary booth. You, you always have to be ready to say something and you, have, and you don't have the time and the mistakes are costly because everybody hears them and you hear it yourself and also your language, what you talk and you have to make sure that you're constructive. You cannot just make a stupid joke. Uh, that, that, that's exciting, that's fun. And when you can catch something before it happens, then you're, you're, you're proud, proud, proud of that moment. So yes, there's a little bit this, this same competitive nature and perform, performing being better than, than you should and so on, that, that kicks in. So, so, so that's fun and I'm drained at the end of, of a weekend. So yeah, so the American series is only a few races, that would be good and we'll, we'll be doing a race with the official Subaru. That, that's what I find nice is that to be with a constructor, to, to get the call, to, 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 still, be, to still be able to, 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 to get these kind of calls is exciting. And to go back to the commentary quickly, are you a diligent person? Do you do a lot of research or do you? No. But it's very easy for me to get info in the, in the paddock. I, I, I know I know everyone, and so normally it, it's uh, and, and I can see what's happening. You, you know I can feel it normally, so I just don't go where I don't know. That's all. Well, Jack, it's but been no, a- I don't spend a week preparing and looking and reading and no, definitely not. <laughs> Jack, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on Beyond the Grid. Um, Thank you. And uh, hey, see you at the next race. Collecting classic computers? Who expected that? And how can you fail to be convinced by his passionate defence of Kimi Raikkonen at Ferrari? I told you he had a lot to say for himself. Some fascinating stories too. The way he so unashamedly set out to psychologically destroy Heinz Harold Frentzen left a bit of a chill. The lengths these guys will go in order to emerge as top dog. Great chatting to you, Jacques. Thanks for your time. Next week, I'll be talking to someone else with another collection of great F1 stories. In the meantime, please subscribe to Beyond the Grid to ensure you don't miss out. You can rate and review us too. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and your favorite podcast app. And if you have something you want to tell us, then drop us a line using the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid, and you can reach me, as ever, on Twitter at Tom Clarkson F1. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audioboom. Until next time... Keep it flat out.